Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host on this five-year adventure through God's entire Word. And today, our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, is going to take us back to Ephesians chapter 5 for more great teaching on the topic of love and marriage. If you can, why don't you turn there now? And as you do that, let's say hello to Greg Harris, Through the Bible's president, who's here with some great letters from our fellow listeners on the Bible bus. Hey, Greg. Hey, Steve. Great to see you. Great to be with the whole family today. And uh, we're going to have a family time of just hearing from some of the other members on the Bible bus. And as we listen to these great responses and encouraging testimonies, I also want to point out that we've gotten some really great feedback from some, quote, new Sunday sermons. Of course, Dr. McGee has been with the Lord for pushing 40 years now, but our team found some great uh, sermons that we had not put on the air, and uh, we, we call it pulling them out of the vault. Yeah. And uh, some of the listeners really have, have loved these new messages. Yeah, this first one from Laura writes, My husband and I have relocated to Tennessee. What a blessing to have through the Bible wherever I live. I used to listen to the daily broadcast on my drive to work through my iPhone app. Being able to continue listening through the app gives me comfort since I've moved away from everything that's familiar to me. The Bible bus is one of the constants in my life. Praise God for technology that is used for good. And then Laura continues, Thank you for this ministry. Steve and Greg are always a source of encouragement. I can hear the joy and enthusiasm for the Lord and the ministry in your voices. I am also a World Prayer Team member, but I must confess it's been hit and miss to pray daily. Now that I am semi-retired, I'm asking God to help me be faithful to pray each day that the World Prayer Team emails arrive in my inbox. I continue to pray for TTB and send monthly support to keep the Bible bus running. Wow. Great, encouraging response. Um, Let's hear from Rita in Maine, who says, I've been a listener since 1982, when I became a Christian, maybe before. I was a stubborn soul, but God kept reaching out to me. So my personal conversion was not instantaneous, as is for some, but a long, slow process as God kept reaching out to me in many ways. And Rita continues, The Lord used WHCF, a new Christian radio station that we started listening to before I was a Christian. Hmm. Let me just stop and say, isn't that awesome, Steve? We know some of the people listening to Through the Bible are not Christians Yet. Yes. Yes. So she goes on simply because it didn't have ads. We liked the music and I ended up listening to through the Bible without really knowing what it was. I had started reading the Bible on a challenge to show what I disagreed with. (laughs) And let me stop again. There's a long line of people in history that have tried that and end up at the foot of the cross. Yes. We love that. So she goes on after a long time, I finally came to to the realization that although there were some parts I couldn't understand, there was nothing in what Jesus said that I could disagree with. Amen. And I took that step of faith, though I didn't know those words and thought, well, if Jesus is the son of God and I am a mere mortal, it makes sense that I wouldn't understand everything. Just as an ant cannot comprehend a human, I could not comprehend all of the divine. So I made the decision to accept it all and have not turned back since. God then used you to ground me in my faith as I began to devour the Bible, as I said, reading the Bible for breakfast every day. Hmm. I try to share my faith with others, and I would like to have available those three types of Bible bus passes to give out to those I meet. I will be going to see my family in a few weeks, and if possible, I hope to use them there as I have some relatives even more stubborn than I was. What a great letter. What a great, that is so wonderful. Rita, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being um, so on fire with the word of God. And let me pray for us as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you again. Pray that you would bless Rita in her passion to know the Bible. And I pray that that passion would be extended to everyone listening to the program today. Yes, that they would listen to Through the Bible, but more importantly, Lord, that they would devour your word and that you would open their eyes to see and behold wonderful things from your law, Old and New Testament alike. Bless the ministry, bless the word of God as it goes out today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now let's head out to Ephesians 5 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, I did not finish last time the fifth chapter where Paul was talking about what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. It's so much better in every relationship of life, and especially in marriage. When two young people fill with the Spirit of God, believers, they can know what real love is. 
And that's something that two young people today, they don't have the foggiest notion what real love is at all. Now, they know a great deal about sex. Now, Paul takes that Christian home, a home where a husband loves a wife like Christ loved the church, and how wonderful this is. Now, Paul brings together this analogy. He says the husband-wife relationship is so wonderful, it's lifted up, and it's like the relationship of Christ and the church. And Christ loved the church, gave himself for it in the past. The day he's sanctifying that church, washing it with water by the word of God, and the only cleanser he's got is the Bible. That's the reason we're using it. Future, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. And that is the anticipation that the church has been presented to him today. No young man engaged to a young lady thinks that she ought to be put through the fires of persecution or the great tribulation before he marries her. That is unheard of. And imagine anyone saying today that the church has to go through the great tribulation. She's engaged to him, and he's cleansing the church by the washing of the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that he's washing down every organization today that has a steeple and a bell and a pulpit and an organ in it. It means that the believers, he's preparing them for that event. And I can't help but believe that that is something that's really taking place in our day. Now we saw that he draws these two back and forth. He goes from one to the other. He says in verse 30, chapter 5, we are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. That's how close we are to Christ. We're the body. That is the picture. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. And the strongest relationship, of course, was child-parent relation. And that is a wonderful relationship. And today a great many parents are disturbed because they're children turn against them when they reach a certain age. I don't like it. I'd never liked it in my own child, but that's the best thing that could happen. You know what? It's letting Papa and Mama know that one day the little chick is going to move out of the home nest and have one of her own, or the young man will. A man will leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. Now, Paul says here, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. You see, he carries us back to that glorious, wonderful relationship of Christ in the church, and blending it in now, he says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. That's the relationship. It's a love relationship. Let's forget about this subject of obedience. And Paul here, as you notice, he refers back to the relationship that existed in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve. Then when they had children, the children are going to leave them. The day came when they moved out, started their own. And Eve was created to be a helpmeet for Adam. And I think the language is tremendous. She was taken from his side, not molded from the ground as were the animals, but taken from a part of him so that he actually was incomplete until they were together. God fashioned her, I think, the loveliest thing in creation, and he brought her to Adam. As one wag said, that she had to be better looking than man was because he practiced on man, but he really got down to business and he'd had experience when he made woman. She was a help me. She compensated for what he lacked. He wasn't complete in himself. She was made for him, and they became one. And I believe today that two young people, when they meet, that that chemistry begins to work. They are made for each other. And notice what we're told in Genesis 2. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. 
she shall be called woman. Hebrew is a man is ish, and a woman is isha. Just almost the same thing. She was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave unto his wife, they shall be one flesh. Now, I have two illustrations I want to pass on to you today that I think reveals something of this wonderful relationship between a man and a woman that it's lost today with all of this new morality, with this sexual freedom they talk about, which I think is putting a lot of kids in slavery. And this thing just won't work. God has put us on a plane where two Christians can really move to a high plane if they want to. Now, let me use these two illustrations, and I take them out of history. The first one is the story of Abelard and Heloise. When John Lord wrote his great women, he used Heloise as the example of marital love. The story concerns a young ecclesiastic by the name of Abelard. He was a brilliant young teacher and preacher in what became the University of Paris. The canon had a niece by the name of Heloise whom he sent to be under Abelard's instruction because Abelard was known far and near as an outstanding teacher. And this little girl Heloise was a remarkable person, and he was a remarkable man. And you know the story. They fell madly in love. But according to the awful practice of that day, the marriage of a priest was deemed a lasting disgrace. When John Lord wrote their story, he gave this introduction. And I want to share it with you. I want to read this. I think it's almost too beautiful to read in this day. It's like a dew-drenched breeze blowing from a flower-strewn mountain meadow over the slop bucket and pigsty of our contemporary literature and society today. Now I'm quoting from John Law. When Adam and Eve were expelled from paradise, they yet found one flower wherever they wandered, blooming in perpetual beauty. The flower represents a great certitude without which few would be happy, subtle, mysterious, inexplicable, a great boon recognized alike by poets and moralists, pagan and Christian, yet identified not only with happiness but human existence and pertaining to the soul in its highest aspirations. Allied with the transient and the mortal, even with the weak and corrupt, it is yet immortal in its nature and lofty in its aims, at once a passion, a sentiment, and an inspiration. To attempt to describe woman without this element of our complex nature which constitutes her peculiar fascination is like trying to act the tragedy of Hamlet without Hamlet himself. An absurdity, a picture without a central figure, a novel without a heroine, a religion without a sacrifice. My subject is not without its difficulties. The passion or sentiment is degrading when perverted. It is exalted when pure. It's not vice I would paint, but virtue. Not weakness, but strength. Not the transient, but the permanent. Not the mortal, but the immortal. All that is ennobling in the aspiring soul. That's the end of the quotation. Isn't that lovely? Well, now let me make application, as he did, to this wonderful love story. Abelard and Heloise, the teacher and the student, the having fallen in love were not permitted by the church to marry. Therefore, they were married secretly by a friend of Abelard. He continued to teach, but the secret came out when a servant betrayed them, and she was forced into a nunnery. Abelard was probably the boldest thinker whom the Middle Ages produced. At the beginning of the 12th century, he began to preach and teach that the word of God was man's authority, not the church. This man, a great man, became bitter and sarcastic in his teaching because of what had been denied him when he was on his deathbed, for he died a great while before Heloise, being 20 years her senior. 
He asked that she be permitted to come to see him. The church did the cruelest thing of all. They would not allow her to come. Therefore, he penned her a letter. And to me, it's the most pathetic thing I've ever read. He concludes it with this prayer. Will you listen to this? When it pleased thee, O Lord, and as it pleased thee, thou didst join us, and thou didst separate us. Now what thou hast so mercifully begun, mercifully complete. And after separating us in this world, join us together eternally in heaven. And I don't know, but I believe in God's heaven. They are together today. Now, may I say that this is a lovely thing. I wonder if you'd like to hear a story about John Wesley in this connection. It's not told in England. It's told in this country, in Georgia. When John Wesley came as a young missionary to Georgia, the crown had already sent out their nobleman. I think they wanted to get rid of him at court because he was an insipid fellow, devoid of personality and masculinity. Yet due to the terrible custom of that day, the nobility was entitled to marry the finest, and he'd married a woman not only of striking beauty and strong personality, but one who was an outstanding Christian. Then there came into their colony this fiery young missionary, and I think, again, you know the story. They fell in love. And that happens to be John Wesley's love story. He begged her to flee with him and go live among the Indians. She said, no, John, God has called you to go back to England, and he's called you to do some great service for him. It was she who sent John Wesley back to England. The night came for his ship to sail. They had to wait for the tide and the wind. She came down to bid him goodbye. Oh, yes, she helped him that night, and he helped her. But even the worst critics of Wesley say that nothing took place that was wrong. He still begged her to go with him among the Indians and live. The biographer of Wesley says that he came down that gang planked twice, but she sent him back, back to England, back to marry the Methodist Church. He returned to England a broken-hearted man, yet she had become his inspiration. And I don't think that woman that he married was really the one that gave him any inspiration. But it was, I think, this one yonder in Georgia. May I say that it's God that gives this to, I think, believers that are filled with the Holy Spirit. And may I say this young person today, whoever you are, wherever you are, however you are, don't accept anything that's second rate, and don't take anything that's the second best that God has to offer. Take the very best, and he can make it very wonderful for you. Well, may I say that I pass on now to verse 33 of the fifth chapter. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. This is the practical part of it down here. Oh, how sin is marred, this glorious relationship as it's marred everything else. But it can be yours if you want it to be the best. Now we come today to the last chapter, and we see now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And it seems strange that we've looked in the fifth chapter, the church will be a bride, and now the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. But the time words, of course, are important. Now, a friend of mine who's quite a wag and a humorist, he said, you know, said, I'm not sure, but what, that's the way it ought to be. That after they get married, that's when the war begins, and therefore the church should be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Well, may I say that he's being facetious because the important thing is that in the future, the church will be presented to Christ. That's the expectation 
of the church, and today we're in the period of the engagement and the exhibition of the church before the world today. Now we come in this sixth chapter to another side, and the church is a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, the soldier service of the church is important. Yonder in the city of Ephesus was that great temple of Diana, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the most pagan, heathen, grossly immoral, and now it's time for the believer to recognize that he's got an enemy. Not only did the Christians in Ephesus have an enemy, but we have an enemy today. We don't have a temple of Diana, but I think we have something infinitely worse. I think that we're seeing around us many things parading in the name, not only of religion, but of Christianity. That's not Christianity at all. Now you have here, in the first nine verses of this chapter 6, the soldier's relationship. Then verses 10 and 12, the soldier's enemy. We need to know our enemy. And the soldier's protection in verses 13 through 18. And then the soldier's example. Because you see, Paul was a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then we have really the soldier's benediction in verses 23 and 24. Now we'll just get our foot in the door here because the first part of the chapter, which opens with instructions to children and to parents and to servants and masters, it may seem very far-fetched and foreign to the life of the soldier, but such is due to an oversight in giving prominence to the training of the soldier. You see, a soldier's training does not start in boot camp. It begins when he's a child in the home, and that's important. So Paul begins, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. This is something that we're told today that back in, you remember during World War II, that they said in the Navy that in the early days of our nation, they had wooden ships and iron men. But today we have iron ships and paper doll man. Well, maybe that's not entirely accurate, but here is a report from the Great Lakes Naval Training Station, and will you listen to it? Some problems faced in the training of Navy personnel. 20% of all young men in the United States attaining the age of Navy enlistment of 17 years must be rejected because of previous criminal records. Another 20% must be rejected because of personality, psychological, or health problems. 7% of all enlistees fail to measure up to recruit training. Severe problems are faced in the training of young men who must be trained in the simple things that should have been learned at home. At 17, a young man ought to be ready to launch into the training program. The Navy finds that they can easily put a uniform on the man. It is putting a man into the uniform that is causing such problems. Now, I understand that that's even greater today. And even in our so-called Christian schools, that the students graduating from Christian Bible schools and colleges, only 10% go into foreign missions. And 37% of graduating students go into home missions. 53% go into secular work. Of the 10% who go to a foreign mission feel a startling number return after the first term as casualties. Training is essential if the soldiers to fight properly and be victorious over the enemy. This is important to see. Therefore, children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. That's where they... Training for life begins for a child of God. It's not in the church. It's not in the Sunday school. It's in the home. That's the important thing. But we'll be talking about that next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved.
For more on God's view of love and marriage, visit ttb.org forward slash booklets. There you can download a free copy of Dr. McGee's digital booklet that's called The Best Love. Or you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find it. Again, that's ttb.org or 1-800-65-BIBLE. We'll study God's model for the family next time as the Bible bus continues to roll through Ephesians chapter 6. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll be here, Lord willing, and I'll save you a seat. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.